So I'm restarting slightly ahead of uh, schedule. I'm Marco Ventura from Siena in order to share with you um, the uh, virtual uh, um, exhibition, um, which is called uh, Shots on Security that we present today. This is a part of uh, this final stage of the project. So um, accompanying this final uh, conference, we have the release of uh, a um, virtual exhibition uh, on security. The exhibition has been prepared by the photographers of the Terra project, who specialize on um, sort of social, social photography uh, with innovative uh, techniques, include the drone, uh, drone photography. And uh, the um, exhibition is actually um, uh, presented. You have the, the link uh, in the chat, and the, the link um, drives you to the, um, well, the, the landing page is, in fact, at the website of, of BSEC, of the project you have some texts uh, presenting the, um, thank you, Isabella Mazze, um, who's, who's, who's leading us to, through, through the page, you have some text of presentation, including very interesting text prepared by the photographers themselves. And then the virtual tour, and you, you, you can enter this um, um, exhibition, uh, uh, space and, and and you have uh, photographs on security what well when we uh, started the project our idea was just you know the desolation of uh, the urban landscape uh, as a reaction to security concerns and uh, when we decided to move the exhibition uh, online because of the COVID-19 restrictions the photographers brilliantly uh, suggested to uh, also have photos about the desolation of the urban landscape due to um, COVID-19 um, precautionary restrictions. So you, you, you now have both. There's a distancing, sort of distancing because of threat, uh, of security threats by terrorists, and you also have you know, social distancing uh, related to the COVID-19 um, crisis. And uh, so um, I'm giving, uh, well, you, you, you're very welcome to visit. Uh, you're very welcome to feed us back on whatever your th thoughts you might have, what might be your reaction if you feel like you want to um, draft short texts, we will be able to, to post them. And uh, as I mentioned, this is um, the, the um, um, completion of the of our Jamone project, uh, coupling our reflection in this final conference and you know theoretical frames and and, and our discussion with um, with photos and with something probably a bit more expressive um, in terms of uh, sharing our feelings. Uh, Pasquale Mikino, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we ended with a discussion on uh, the relationship uh, which uh, at this point are, uh, are key between uh, data protection and antitrust. And now Maria Casora from Royal University of uh, Women in Bahrain, where she serves as general counsel and assistant professor of commercial law, will give us a presentation with the title Beyond Tradition, Retaining the Concept of Abuse of Dominance Through the Lens of Personal Data Protection. So Maria, uh, you have the floor. Usual rules in time management apply. Okay. Thank you very much, Pasquale. And good morning, everybody. Before starting the presentation, I would like to thank my colleagues at the University of Siena for having included me since the beginning in this project. I relocated in Bahrain five years ago, but I'm glad to see that despite time elapsed, my colleagues still uh, care about continuing 
some kind of collaboration. So I'm very pleased to have been part of the project and also to speak today at the final conference. Now, as Pasquale told us this morning in the opening remarks, data, personal data, data protection cannot be confined to one legal sector only, to one legal field but we need to look at this topic from different perspectives and competition law is one of those. So in my presentation, I will be discussing the interaction between EU competition law and personal data protection in digital markets with reference to the online platforms holding dominant positions and specifically social media platforms which tend to use the data collected through the access to some services in order to gain anti-competitive advantages by direct or indirect exploitation of the personal data. Now, the broad questions that lie at the bottom of these discussions, in my opinion, are the following. Firstly, what are the goals of competition law in the digital economy? Secondly, since data privacy is becoming an increasingly important component of non-price competition in the market of digital platforms, is a privacy a new competition problem? Or in other words, should privacy be protected also through competition? And irrespective of the theoretical different scope of application between competition law and personal data protection, what would be the best regulatory approach to social media platforms that collect personal data and in doing so might harm consumers when they are in dominant positions. Now the questions, as we all know, are quite complex and that's the reason why I have decided to adopt a quite plain approach and try to provide answers by looking at the rule of law, so what the legislator currently can give us, then the enforcement, and lastly, what the scholars have been discussing on this topic. Now, let us start with the rule of law. Obviously, being firms in dominant positions, the only thing we can resort to is Article 102 of the treaty, and in particular, it's later letter A, which talks of abuse uh, that may consist in the direct or indirect use of unfair purchase or selling price on other unfair trading conditions. However, the wording is very broad and so one can interpret it in one way or another based on the interests that we want to protect the most. If we then turn to the GDPR, apart from the consent, the importance of consent, we have what has been mentioned already this morning, that is Article 20 of the GDPR, the data portability. So the right of the data owner, the data subject, to receive the personal data and to from the controller in a form that is readable, in a format that is readable, and then eventually move this data from one controller to another. However, the question of the effective consent is still there, and also the way in which we can really exercise the rights granted by Article 20 of the GDPR is not really clear. And that's why we have to turn to the enforcement. And as far as the enforcement is concerned, the main character in this field is obviously Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. He is a famous social media platform that 
recently has been under the scrutiny of the German competition watchdog, the Bundeskartellamt or Federal Cartel Office. What happened is that in February 2019, the FCO prohibited Facebook US, Facebook Ireland and Facebook Germany from making the use of Facebook.com by private users residing in Germany, conditioned upon the collection of users and the device related data by Facebook without providing effective consent. Because as we all know, Facebook is dominant in its market because it also own other corporate services such as Instagram or WhatsApp. And since the users were not really asked to provide a specific consent about the migration of data from these collateral services to the main platforms and vice versa, then the FCO said, no, this is a breach. And the important aspect of this decision is that the breach has been tackled from two different perspectives. So from a data protection perspective, what the FCO said is, well, the consent has not been given. And by the way, it is a prerequisite to use the platform. So either you take it or you leave it. When we move to the competition law perspective, what the FCO said is that the data protection violation performed by Facebook that had a dominant position in the market of the social media in Germany may also amount to a violation of Section 19.1 of the German Competition Act, which prohibits abuse of a market position. So in doing so, basically what the FCO said is a data protection violation now turns into a breach of antitrust because we need to protect the free market. And so likes, shares, analytics and surroundings tip the scale towards the application of competition law as an alternative to data protection, to privacy law, because of the way in which the data are collected. Now, this will be a wonderful story that was written in 300 pages. However, the order issued by the FCO was stopped because Facebook obviously appealed the order and on 26 August 2019, the Higher Regional Court of Dusseldorf temporarily suspended the order. So even though Facebook was given by the FCO 12 months to mitigate the breach and also was asked to submit a kind of improvement plan within four months, nothing happened. Now, why the court decided to temporarily suspend the order? Firstly, because the court stated that there were serious doubts regarding the legitimacy of the order, because what the FCO seemed to say is, well, because Facebook is in dominant position, even though there was no actual breach. But hypothetically, Facebook can use its dominant position to obtain anti-competitive benefits, and as a result, the consumers are harmed. However, based on the German Competition Act, the dominant position per se cannot be prohibited, but is the abuse. 
And also another very important element that was taken into account by the court is that Article 19.2 of the German Competition Act states that an abuse exists if the dominant undertaking demands payment. However, as we all know, Facebook is not charging, even though we also know that the currency we are paying in order to access the platform is giving up our personal data. Therefore, another point that was made by the court is that the FCO did not really explain the reasons why the data collection turned into Facebook acquiring the dominant position because, and this is one from a legal perspective, one of the main points used by the court, there was not really a causal relationship between Facebook's data processing in breach of the GDPR and its dominant position. So in the rationale of the court, even if the foreclosure effects existed, the FCO's order was not appropriate to rectify the situation because, and this is another very important point, the FCO did not tackle the way in which Facebook collects the data on its main platforms, but only on the collateral services that Facebook own. So in a nutshell, if we want to compare between the approach taken by the FCO and the approach of the higher regional court, what we can say is that the FCO basically deemed that the data protection boundaries set forth in the GDPR were clearly overstepped in the view of Facebook just being dominant even though this is a truism, because we know that in the end, Facebook is dominant in the market dominated by Facebook. Because as of today, there are no real alternatives to the services that Facebook offers. On the other side, the higher regional court of Dusseldorf took a more effects-based approach. And because the causality link was not existing as suspended, as I said, at least temporarily, the order. As of now, there is no final decision on the merits of the case, so everybody is waiting to see what the court will say in terms of merits. Now, if we move from these national approach to what has been done in terms of enforcement at European Union level, we can see that the connection or interplay between competition law and privacy has been rejected. As far as the Court of Justice is concerned, we have one decision that is quite old, the case Asnef's Equifax, rendered in 2006, where discussing an exchange of information submitted according to Article 101, so it was not an abuse, but still <laughs> something related to competition, the court established that any possible issues relating to the sensitivity of personal data are not as such a matter of competition law, they may be resolved only on the basis of the provisions governing data protection. If we look at the European Commission, every time the Commission from 2008 until 2017 has been dealing with mergers that could result in the entity having at its disposal a huge amount of data, always had these two fields of laws are and have 
to remain separated. Now, the court did not say, well, we cannot really stay, the commission, sorry, did not really say there is no infringement. But what the commission seemed to say is, well, I'm dealing with a merger. Whatever is the outcome of this merger in terms of personal data protection is not really my concern. Now, if we move from the enforcement to the third approach, the scholars' opinions, obviously, this hand of approach taken at the European Union level has been criticized. However, the topic is under discussion, and as it always happens when we are dealing with this very recent and complicated legal phenomena, we have somebody that is supporting of the commingo between competition law and personal data protection and others that believe these two fields must be kept separated. So they support what has been called the separation dogma. Now, as far as the privacy-driven theories of antitrust harms are concerned, what the supporters of merging the two legal fields have been saying is that, firstly, the structural features of digital markets strengthen the market power of online platform. And consequentially, there is a decrease of incentives to compete to offer high level of privacy or privacy-friendly products. 10 minutes. Okay. The second uh, point that has been brought forward is that the mergers between companies holding big data increases the amount of data owned by the entity resulting from the merger, and as a result, it will have more tools to profile individuals and invade privacy. Another argument is that privacy has been seen as any other quality that the products have. And so if we consider privacy as a quality, this means that the different business undertakings will need to compete in order to offer the best level of privacy. And the third argument that is pretty much the one that was used by the FCO is that privacy policies shall be investigated from a competition point of view whenever they can also potentially affect competition because are implemented by a company holding a dominant position in that market. On the other side, the opponents of this mixed approach have basically said that according to competition laws worldwide, no firm has an antitrust obligation to produce the best goods, either in the digital or in the offline markets. And then has been stressed upon that the protection of the individual control over the personal data is out of the normative scope of competition law. As far as the argument of privacy equal to equality of the goods is concerned, those that criticize this approach basically state that it is very difficult to assess privacy as one of the competition law criteria. And lastly, it has been stated that the GDPR with Article 20 already protects the rights of the individuals to keep control over their digital identities. That's why competition law shall just continue 
focusing on what is the scope, that is to say, the effective functioning of the market. So, in order to conclude, since I know I don't have too much time left, and if we go back to the three questions that I have made at the beginning of my presentation, I would like to leave the audience with the following thoughts, and I call them thoughts because obviously the subject is in evolution. As far as the goals of competition law in, a digital, in the digital economy are concerned, it is unquestionable that the boundaries of competition law have changed. The growth of data-driven markets raises challenges at both competition policy level and at enforcement level due to the complexity of conducting the competitive assessment of business conducts in such dynamic markets. And so, since technology evolves faster than the legal norms, rethinking the wide spectrum of values which characterizes the new competition law, such as efficiency, fairness, consumer welfare, economic freedom, and market integration might be more effective than adopting a strict ad hoc rule of law for these ever-evolving dynamic markets. If we move to the second question, shall we protect privacy or data in general terms through the competition law? Well, one element that cannot be overlooked is that the widespread use of digital platforms is causing individuals to lose control over their personal data because most users just give up their data quite easily since they don't have any choice if they want to use their service. And so if one were to stress upon the fact that since several years, consumer welfare is considered as a goal of the EU competition law and policy, and also that privacy concerns can produce effect, positive effects in the data-driven market, then the commingle between competition law and privacy could be justified. Moreover, in my opinion, this mixed approach is also justified in the light of what is called the privacy paradox, i.e. the paradoxical behavior of individuals who claim to be concerned about privacy but undertake very little precautions to protect the personal data due to the fascination of zero-cost services. And in doing so, as a result, reinforce the market power of those undertaking, like Facebook, that gain profits through selling personal data through the data brokers, or they aim to develop algorithms, tailor advertising, and offer personalized products based on the data they have been collected. So, simply put, the rationale against the separation dogma, in my view, is the following. If we agree that one of the aims of competition law in the EU is to also to achieve consumer welfare, whenever the consumer is unable to reach on his own the optical, optimal level of precaution, then the legislative intervention must operate upstream as to minimize unfair conducts by the business operator and support privacy innovation. Basically, competition law can be used to educate consumers on how to better and more effectively protect their data. The last point, the best regulatory approach. We know there is never a, a best regulatory approach, 
But from a competitional perspective, I think that what the SEO has been saying, i.e. there is a harm to competition if you are in a dominant position and so we can resort to revisitate the concept of exploitative abuses according to Article 102, Letter A of the treaty, we can say that now a new fangled data privacy abuse has come to life. And so I personally see that this is the correct trajectory in order for the competition law and policy in the European Union to consider what is the best assessment criteria for other types of violations that as a result will also improve the level of protection of privacy in the digital markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. You don't even need my second warning. So you conclude exactly on time and thank you very much for respecting that. It's uh, very important as relevant was your presentation, I think. Uh, I have seen uh, quite a few studies also concerning the, if you look at these in terms of legal compliance, Mm -hmm. how compliance with data protection can be used by especially big unicorn companies as a kind of anti-competitive tool because uh, other companies, smaller companies have uh, more difficulties in compliance. So uh, there is definitely an interlink there and I have appreciated very much the, the Italian debate where it has been stressed that this link should be there and push, there, has, there has been pushes from uh, people working in the antitrust authority uh, the report that they published in relation with the data protection and so on. And I think and I hope uh, that we will uh, see this forward, also especially taking into consideration the new European data strategy. So um, I think that we will uh, keep the question for the three speakers at the end, because we will have some time. Mm -hmm. And we can move uh, um, to the next speaker, which is uh, Silvio Ranise. Uh, now, uh, having Silvio in this panel, I think is very good because Silvio is a, a non-lawyer. Silvio is the head of the research area on cybersecurity uh, and uh, security and trust at, at FBK. Now, those among us lawyers who are non-legal positivists, we usually are a minority, uh, and I am a non-legal positivist in the sense that uh, I believe that uh, when assessing and analyzing the law, we have to look also at the context of the law and other sources. And this is particularly delicate and relevant uh, when we look at this kind of topic concerning data. I mean, we have learned from several scholars, he among them, of course, Lawrence Lessing, with a famous book on code as law, that in many of these kind of debates, what is the law is determined by coders. So people that work with Silvio usually, so engineers. So there is a strong interrelationship between law and people working in engineer and the presentation the presentation that Silvio is giving us today is titled Machine Learning Algorithms and Public Administration Need for Reconciling Transparency and Efficiency. I mean, this is key. Also, if you look, of course, at the European regulation, when there is a key word, which is the word accountability, and then, of course, transparency and fairness and all the, the principles established by the GDPR, the more big data pools we have, and as I mentioned before, there is a big discussion today in the European Union on data spaces, data spaces that will collect big data upon which machine learning algorithm will work, the more we will need to have a kind of uh, algorithm impact assessment, to use the language from the GDPR, or algorithmic transparency. So I think that uh, Silvio will uh, take all some of this topic from his own perspective, which is a technical perspective, and we look very much forward to hearing from you and learning something new, Silvio. So you have the floor. Usual draconian rules on warnings apply to you as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for the introduction and for specifying that I am uh, not a lawyer, of course. So please uh, bear with me about any nonsensical stuff that I may say about laws. But uh, as, uh, as uh, Pasquale said, basically, the, the idea is to present uh, what we are uh, feeling about the, uh, the, the legal context, basically, from the perspective of a, uh, of a, of a, of a, of a from a technical perspective. So, 
First of all, let me thank for the uh, invitation. At the, at the same time, I have to uh, complain with the uh, with the organizer not to <laughs> dwell the physical <laughs> uh, meeting in the beautiful uh, Siena. But uh, I hope that there will be other times in which we can meet and uh, shake hands together or together. Anyway, so let's proceed to the to the discussion. Basically, um, the the idea is that. Uh, 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 machine learning algorithms uh, are attractive also for the public administration because of, of several reasons. Uh, many are obvious, like providing better uh, uh, services to citizens, uh, avoiding queues, uh, etc. And uh, we have seen also recently, because of the COVID uh, uh, emergency, that uh, there are a lot of interest in, in the digital transformation because uh, basically it's a way out of the of uh, the physical uh, uh, lockdown that uh, all uh, we have experienced. Also is a way to involve basically citizens uh, more uh, directly into uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, the democra democratic life basically and the interaction with the, the public administration. There are many other uh, uh, applications that are uh, important. For, from the point of view of the, uh, of the public administration, one of the main interests is uh, to save money, basically. And, uh, for example, a recent uh, overview here in Italy uh, basically unveils uh, uh, that uh, there can be potential for 25 billion euro um, uh, uh, savings uh, uh, if we uh, have uh, a push in the investment, basically and in more putting more money more uh, skills uh, and, uh, and more uh, also uh, i believe uh, uh, human skills uh, developing human skills uh, in using this kind of tools basically so given this uh, what is an algorithm basically an algorithm uh, should be differentiated from what is uh, run on uh, on a machine which is a program or a software or a code a piece of code basically an algorithm is a kind of recipe for solving a, a given problem this is a, at a very high level of abstraction so it, it's a mathematical object it's a mathematical abstraction with certain properties that can be shown then uh, this algorithm, this pure object that lives in the mathematical world basically should be uh, down, brought down to a level of abstraction which is suitable to be executed on a machine. This is a lower level of abstraction that takes into account a lot of uh, other uh, de details uh, that make it executable by current uh, uh, microprocessor on, uh, the, on, on what we use usually uh, the, the, the various types of computer uh, devices that we are used to. So basically programs uh, that are uh, concretization of algorithms takes input and transform them in output. Basically this is a very abstract view of this. So the interesting part is how we create algorithms. So in the traditional way uh, there are humans that look at the real world with some kind of problem, create a model. This is a standard in engineering. A model of a, a, a real problem is an abstraction that uh, ignores the cer certain details, basically. And then uh, come up with a set of rules of instruction that are able to solve, basically, the uh, problem in this, uh, uh, in this model. So engineers know that the model uh, uh, does not uh, uh, precisely correspond to the uh, real phenomenon that they want to describe, but is useful uh, uh, despite the, uh, the, the details that are ignored in order to make some prediction on the, on the phenomenon that they are going to, uh, to describe. And so basically being aware of the various uh, uh, abstraction is very important here. Okay, so basically it comes up with the, the set of instructions that uh, form the algorithms, then there are uh, software developers that transform this into a concrete program that is run and transform our input into, into output. This is the traditional way to do it. So the new way, a more recent way, which is uh, 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 related to uh, uh, advances in uh, um, uh, mm, machine learning, but more in general in artificial intelligence, uh, basically uh, split the creation 
of uh, algorithm and their execution in two steps. One is the training. Basically, data are collected directly from the real world through um, sensors and etc. And then there is a machine that is it's a black box, uh, basically, uh, that performs uh, the training from this uh, data, digests this data and crunches this data, and then creates the model and uh, the set of rules that allows, for example, to classify things, uh, etc. OK, then these rules uh, are uh, translated to an um, uh, algorithm, basically, and uh, uh, that, uh, again, as before, is executed on a machine and transformed input into outputs. Basically, outputs can be seen as the C, basically. OK, so it's very different from what has been done uh, uh, before, because uh, most of the thing, uh, most of the process is completely automated. So. Basically, these are the in in a in a graphical format uh, how you can see that how you can compare the two approaches. The traditional view, basically, the human um, teaches the computer a, a set of uh, a detailed instruction to solve a, a program a problem. Sorry, instead, basically, in the re, in the more recent view, the human feeds data. And then it's the, uh, the 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 computer programs that takes care of uh, creating the model and executing the program uh, that uh, solves a, a, a given a given problem. So basically, there are different level of trust and efficiency related to these two approaches. Basically, and uh, in between there is human beings and the role of human beings. In the traditional view. Uh, when a uh, human beings uh, try to solve a problem, uh, uh, abstract away a lot of details, uh, the focusing on a reduced number of features of the problem, uh, and uh, by using these few features, basically, uh, is able to uh, define a set of rules to solve a problem. This leads to more transparency, at least uh, at the algorithmic level, not much at the uh, program level, uh, the situation is more or less clear because basically it, it is uh, uh, the product of our mind, of our brain, basically, and uh, usually we trust ourselves uh, uh, because we have methodology and there are a lot of uh, engineering practices that allows us to come up with the, the right, uh, uh, the right, um, uh, the right models and the, the right programs, basically. Instead, the recent view, the machine learning view, basically, takes care of a large number of features at the same time. And the rules that come up from the training phase are implicit, are not very clear because they depend on a large number of features. So it's the opposite. We work by abstracting things. These techniques, the rules, works by uh, creating rules uh, from uh, very concrete examples. So the rules that comes up uh, comes out from the first phase, the training phase, uh, are implicit, uh, and so this leads to less transparency. On the other hand, the trust that we put into the abstract uh, uh, models uh, that are created by human usually receives a lot of trust or more trust, let's say, but are less typically efficient. And on the other hand, it's the opposite. We trust less the machine, but these machines are incredibly eff efficient in terms of performances and, and precision, basically. So if we compare the views, basically, in terms of efficiency, traditional algorithms uh, like uh, compare, can be seen as bicycle, uh, and uh, the the one uh, created by machines as uh, sport cars, basically. Uh, but from the point of view of trust, uh, also uh, we as human beings, especially when we, uh, in, involves our decision uh, impacting of our rights and freedom, basically, we distrust. We tend to distrust these machine learning algorithms and instead trust basically those that are created by humans, or we trust more these uh, humans basically, or something that is the product of of, uh, of uh, standard practice and uh, uh, driven by humans basically. This is a little bit strange in the sense that even humans. Uh, in many cases, as uh, difficulties in justifying and explaining why they take certain kind of decisions, uh, and uh, also because we work uh, 
on, uh, as I said before, on a few data points uh, that, or uh, focusing on a few features or many data points, ignoring a lot of others because it's the way we work. Our brains uh, may take care of a limited number of uh, things at the same time in order to take a decision. And also because we, what we frequently ignore, uh, or let's say we put uh, under the carpet, is that the data contain bias. Uh, because of several reasons, because of our history, our culture, etc., etc. So this is a quite a complex issue. But uh, when, uh, as I said, uh, this impact uh, basic freedom or important freedom, uh, the bias should be taken care. And uh, we have a dramatic, uh, uh, and uh, this should be balanced much better against efficiency okay in the us they use uh, uh, let's say uh, this kind of machine learning algorithms in order to establish the risk to release or not a certain uh, a certain uh, uh, certain that has a problem with uh, with laws basically and the 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 data on which they are based this kind of uh, uh, algorithms uh, are really biased in terms of racial, uh, etc., and uh, this is dramatically uh, present in the in our news uh, today uh, about uh, that are coming from the U.S. Okay, so this is something that we tend to ignore, and the bias as the very bad. Uh, feature or property that uh, let's say start a a, 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 a very uh, complex uh, self uh, loop in which uh, they uh, augment the the uh, amplitude or their impact uh, uh, by by generating similar and similar um, uh, decision as uh, done as uh, performed in the past. So. There are, when we are using machine learning, we should take care of other stuff as well. Because in certain cases, uh, uh, the decision that we are taking or that cl the classification that these algorithms are, are making are based on a lot of uh, uh, features, as I said before. And in some cases, for example, when they classify dogs versus wolf, for example, or ASCII versus uh, wolf, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the point that they take a uh, decision based on features that are not really important or relevant or that a uh, human being immediately knows that are not relevant. For example, in the background, uh, usually um, uh, wolf are put into in a, in a context where there is no. So in this case, uh, this uh, kind of stupid uh, machine learning algorithm classify ASCII as a wolf because the background uh, there is no okay so we should take care and understand how this kind of machine learning algorithm works in order to understand if they uh, they work properly or not and they take decision based on the right features or not mm -hmm. basically okay but there is even more there is the problem of malicious environment so basically hackers attackers try to exploit uh, this machine learning algorithm uh, to uh, break basically the decision that they may take and this has, can have dramatic consequences here the the the, um, the attack is very very simple not sophisticated from a technical point of view at all this implies to put stickers basically on uh, um on the road signs uh, in order to trick uh, the uh, self-driving cars algorithm that recognize this uh, this uh, this road traffic so they can turn and they can trick the algorithm in order to mis uh, um, classify a stop signal to a, a limit of speed which is, which can have uh, potentially catastrophic consequences in terms of safety of pedestrians or even the uh, drivers of the car okay and this is also uh, a, 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 a leads to another big question who is responsible so in, ca in case of a car accident uh, who is legally accountable and uh, we have seen that uh, 
in Europe, uh, there is a lot of uh, debate and uh, the push for understanding better who is accountable for the choice uh, that derives from uh, machine learning algorithm, basically. Okay, and this is very interesting, uh, uh, even from the point of view of uh, assurances, right? Uh, in, in this uh, in this case, but uh, in order to understand better the situation, we need to understand uh, how uh, and if we can interpret uh, how the the, uh, the the machine learning how the machine learning algorithm works, uh, and uh, uh, understand better uh, if they are uh, they are basing their a decision on uh, some stupid feature or something that uh, can be ignored because it's not uh, representative or important for the problem that they are asked to solve. So here we should make a decision between explanation and the interpretation. Explaining something, uh, explaining an algorithm is a very, very complex issue because it's, uh, it entails the capability to explain really the internal logic of the algorithm. And since the training phase uh, that I have mentioned before creates an algorithm that depends on a lot of features, uh, it's, this is very, very difficult, okay? Instead, uh, a more interesting uh, approach could be to, to, to interpret uh, the uh, working of an algorithm. This means that we don't need really to understand the internal logic of the algorithm, but uh, try to understand how the input to this algorithm is uh, uh, associated to the output of the algorithm. So not only in terms of the internal working that can be seen as a black box, we don't know exactly what is inside, but uh, 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 by, uh, let's say, understanding the association between the input and the output in, in a more abstract uh, setting. So uh, explaining something uh, is uh, uh, the, the possibility to explain machine learning algorithm is a strict subset or interpreting the, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their workings. But again, even explanation or interpretation are should be carefully um, uh, interpreted again sorry for the the pun uh, but the point is that uh, uh, we need to understand first of all that there are two things to uh, interpret or to explain the first thing is the training phase so uh, understanding how the uh, the the training uh, step uh, uh, created model okay so this is a very can be a very difficult thing that uh, clashes definitely against transparency because in most cases uh, the mathematics that is underlying uh, and the, the number of features that are considered about this mathematical model are too many okay so the the the, the point is that uh, the the simpler from the mathematical point of view uh, is uh, the the creation uh, the, the 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 technique used to underline the training model the easier is uh, to explain it. the more sophisticated for example in the case of deep learning the 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 more difficult it is to explain of thank course you. thank you the, uh, of course uh, the point is that uh, um i would say um the the faster the algorithm uh, in this case, the deep learning algorithm are the faster, more precise, etc., and the more difficult that they are explaining, and the, the, easy, the easier the mathematical model and the easier to explain, the uh, less precise and, uh, and faster they are, basically. And then there are another step that should be explained, so how the prediction algorithm or the algorithm that has been created in the uh, uh, first phase produce the results, basically, okay? And here again, we need to understand a lot of uh, different uh, um, things that uh, are in this uh, kind of black box that has been created by previous uh, phase that uh, whose difficulty is really to understand how modifying or uh, changing the values of certain features has an impact on the output that is produced, on the decision that is produced. So here again, several kinds of uh, uh, explanation are possible. And uh, for example, a, a way to simplify our lives is to understand how a single, for example, decision depends on the output 
per, per case, let's say, instead of trying to, to understand a, a, a general, to derive a general rule of how, how the output uh, is associated to, to the input. But, okay. So, for example, a good explanation in the case of the fact that uh, uh, to understand that uh, the uh, previous example about classifying ASCII as a work because the background was white uh, was uh, is simply to understand that uh, the explanation, but basically a notion of explanation in this case that is immediately and is intuitive for everyone is uh, to show, to ask or to extract from the algorithm which features are more important. And uh, the features, uh, if we ask this uh, by applying uh, appropriate techniques on this particular uh, picture, is that uh, the background uh, uh, is more important and in particular the backgrounds containing snow. So the explanation why it was wrong, the algorithm to classify ASCII as a wolf, uh, this is immediate, okay? But unfortunately, this is not so easy in all, in all cases, basically. Uh, also, another uh, important part of the game is that uh, there are uh, uh, sometimes billions of parameters that are considered at the same time by, for example, deep learning algorithms uh, that are particular classical, very efficient uh, machine learning algorithms here. So understanding uh, how small fluctuations of these parameters uh, combined together may give rise to very different uh, decision is uh, really problematic and uh, out of reach of even for specialists, okay, sometimes. And also audience is relevant. So if I'm explaining the, the, the working of an algorithm to a mathematician, then I can use integrals or other mathematical uh, tools and techniques or notions uh, that are, uh, should be clear for him or her. But then if, I, if a judge, for example, asks me, is there any bias for this algorithm coming from this algorithm, I should not uh, tell him or her uh, that uh, by using uh, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, integral or derivatives, etc., then uh, this, is, this gives rise to a, to a kind of bias. I should tune the explanation to the audience. This is very, very important. Uh, otherwise, uh, even an ex a precise explanation is uh, worthless uh, in, in, if you give uh, the explanation to the wrong audience, basically. So explaining or interpreting uh, 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 this kind of stuff uh, is really an interdisciplinary approach uh, that uh, implies a lot of difficulties, basically. And also, of course, that there is uh, uh, laws that tell us that, uh, in particular, when involved, uh, uh, when the, there are involved uh, public administration and uh, 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 processing that has an impact on fundamental rights, then uh, there should be basically some kind of uh, 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 rights that uh, should be um, uh, respected, and in particular, the right to explanation. So this decision, a good uh, decision, uh, uh, should be a good, uh, so to speak, decision, and the explanation of the decision should be opposable, in the sense that it should be based on, on some on clear reasoning, and uh, the, um, the assumption on which we start from this, uh, to, to make this reasoning, should be uh, proposition that are easy to falsify, right? And uh, uh, so uh, there should be also easy to challenge the assumption and, and in order to modify the, the final decision. So you see, there are a lot of aspects that should be taken care of when uh, you try to reconcile the transparency for accountability, etc., cetera, and, uh, uh, and the tame the efficiency and keep the efficiency and all the gains that we have seen, like uh, reducing cost, uh, making uh, citizen more happy, uh, if we talk about uh, public administration, you know, uh, when we uh, serve them more um, uh, uh, targeted and uh, faster, uh, uh, services, right? So here is uh, the point. So if we look at only one objective, like efficiency, then uh, it's easy, so to speak, uh, because uh, the problem that we are solving is a single objective optimization problem. So the goal is uh, to have a high uh, efficiency uh, from, from this. Unfortunately, when we 
take into consideration also interpretability, this is a completely different problem from a point of view of, uh, of mathematics. It's a multi-objective term optimization problem. And unfortunately, finding the optimal solution is no more as easy as in the case before, where there are one single objective to optimize, uh, to maximize or, or minimize. If we want to, at the same time, have optimal solution for uh, for uh, um, uh, for um, uh, efficiency and interpretability, there is a trade-off between the two. So the, we can uh, characterize a, a frontier of solutions that are optimal, but offer trade-off between efficiency and the interpretability, basically. And this leads, basically, to the theory uh, of uh, Pareto. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Pareto optimality that uh, leads, basically, to find the, the right trade-off between efficiency and interpretability. Unfortunately, and not surprisingly, machine learning basically uh, is very well known now that uh, the easier they are from a mathematical point of view, as, as I said before, the easier to explain are, but the, the less uh, efficient from, uh, for example, efficiency and performances are, and scalability even, and on the other end, the more complex and sophisticated, like deep learning here, the uh, more, uh, uh, the less explainable they are. So we need to take care and to put forward an interdisciplinary approach in order to address this kind of stuff, in order to find the right balance between these two opposing forces and increase trust in, of citizens that uh, are treated with fairness, uh, with respect to this kind of stuff. So th this kind of processing that is automated processing. So my suggestion, the proposal is to embrace a, an open source paradigm, basically, the, which is in Italy is also pushed forward by Agenzia per l'Italia Digitale, for example, that basically push for uh, uh, putting uh, the, the source code of this kind of algorithm uh, open, scrutinable by everyone and especially by different legal and uh, machine learning and citizen and even data protection experts uh, that uh, should uh, discuss and help everyone each other to find the right trade off between interpretability and uh, and efficiency so thanks a lot for your attention uh, thank you very much, Silvio. I was uh, amazed by one fact is that one of the key words you used, I don't know if you did it on purpose, now you can reveal it, was black box. Mm -hmm. And uh, one key book in the area by lawyers, by Professor Frank Pasquale, the title of the book is exactly The Black Box Society. So I don't know if you were familiar with that book and you did it on purpose, or you mm -hmm. just took it from your engineering discussion. So that, that was quite uh, amazing for me that in the end, uh, engineers and lawyers uh, have ended up using the same kind of language. Actually, I will share the, a link to the book in the chat so people that might have an interest can go and have a look to the, um, to the book. But uh, thank you very much for your... But you can tell us if you were aware of that work or not. <laughs> no, not aware of that work, but uh, the feeling here is that is a, from my side, from my field, is that they are black box, really. Yeah. Even for us, in most cases. No, no. I, I have read uh, Professor Pasquale's book, and I mean, he tries to develop that concept from a legal perspective. So, quite useful to see the two perspectives by using the same kind of uh, of language there. So, you might be interested in reading a legal book once for a time in your life uh, maybe sure, you sure. maybe you might learn something from lawyers as well besides us learning from you so thank you and thank, thank you. you for being on time so we move to our final um, presentation uh, which is from uh, uh, Lubika Georgievich if I have pronounced the name well and Lubica is a senior research associate and head of the Justice and Governance Cluster at ECMI in Flensburg, Germany. And the title of her presentation is Processing of Ethnic Data, Juggling Between Data Protection and Diversity Management. So we go back to a more kind of human rights focused discussion. So 30 minutes for Lubica and you have the floor. Please welcome. Thank you very much, Pascal. First, um, to 
share. I have a presentation. I hope it works. Uh, do you see my presentation, please? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to uh, thank to Alessandro Palmieri, a, a good friend of mine, who invited me and ECMI to join the project, but also who invited me to present in this conference. I also want to express my uh, gratitude to other uh, members of the Siena team, uh, dear colleagues and professors, for their management of this project, for smooth coordination and cooperation within the project, and for organizing uh, this conference in these difficult times and for concluding this uh, project. So now, uh, back to the presentation, um, I would like to uh, present uh, the issue of ethnic um, data collection and uh, diversity management through showing uh, uh, or to exploring three nexus uh, uh, aspects. I hope do you see the change now because something I changed the slide. Is it yes. okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to I would like to to, to show it through three uh, aspects uh, which are interlinked. First aspect is about importance of ethnic data, uh, and this is crucial for us working with uh, national and other minorities. Uh, why uh, we need data in, uh, and and which data are needed. The second uh, aspect, which should be a core of my presentation today, is challenges of data protection and especially for the reason that uh, most of the countries um, ex um, point as a, as a point of justification not to collect ethnic data, uh, point out uh, data protection regulations and what are actually uh, legal scope, what is the legal scope of uh, protection of uh, ethnic data. And finally, as a side remark to my presentation, I also want, want to point out out some methodological challenges uh, of to collection and processing of ethnic data in terms of how what is actually ethnicity and how we can measure ethnic uh, ethnicity and what again which, which is linked to the question what data is needed so first i would like to to, to share with you uh, several quotations from european actors uh, relevant for uh, integration and uh, minority protection uh, and to show you this um, uh, uh, international international point of view uh, about the need of uh, ethnic data uh, first of all uh, european commission uh, against racism and uh, and intolerance uh, already in its general policy recommendation one of uh, 1996 expressed the need for data which will assist in assessing and evaluating the situation of experiences of groups which are particularly vulnerable to racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism and intolerance. Then uh, the ma major monitoring body when it comes to national minority protection, Advisory Committee on the Framework Convention for National Minorities, uh, expressed in its thematic commentary number four of 2016, the need for reliable and disaggregated equality data related to the number and situation of persons belonging to national minorities. And finally, I also, uh, I also picked up one, another quote from the OSC High Commissioner on National Minorities and the Ljubljana Guidelines on Integration of Diverse Society, in which it was put, pointed out that police, policy development should be based on the collection of systematic and comprehensive information and its objective analysis. Data should be disaggregated according to criteria relevant for integration policy, such as ethnicity, or language. So we can see that uh, at, the at the international or European level, uh, there is a consensus that there is a need for data. And these data, we can now, now I can just uh, sum up, these data are, are needed for, uh, to, to, to serve different purposes. The main purpose is uh, achieving equality and combating uh, discrimination. Uh, the other is national minority protection in terms of 
of uh, democratic tra demographic thresholds for access to some minority rights or um, you know, parameters for monitoring and evaluation of positions of persons belonging to national minorities and so on and so forth. And then there is also this uh, aspect of equality integration policies where data is needed for information on equality and integration levels and uh, for implementing monitoring and evaluating policies. So, uh, if we are clear that data is needed, then the other question is what data? Because there is a pool of data, so then what is the data? Usually what is uh, considered as needed and essential ethnic data is statistical macro data. This is the data that can, that can indicate position of relevant groups of population in various areas of life. It's about ethnic structure of population, employees, students, consumers, and so on. So it's aggregated data on individuals, and uh, it actually showed trends how minority groups are represented in the, in the various areas, areas of, of society, or how they are affected by some uh, in, by some policies. Uh, for example, now in this uh, health uh, situation with the COVID pandemics, there is also intensive call for data about how minorities are affected with the pandemic and also with the measures fighting the pandemic. And as you can imagine, they're, they're, these data are usually lacking, except in those countries which have traditional, let's say, practices of collecting such data. Uh, then there is a second group of uh, data, which I will not uh, address today. These are data revealing the status of group without interfering with data on individuals, number of minority schools, number of minority media, and so on and so forth, so which are not personal in any way, but they can be indicative of how uh, minority groups, uh, about the status of minority groups. And finally, there are uh, minor, uh, personal data revealing racial and ethnic origin that is from the very beginning to the end of processing process, process are remain personal data. And this uh, collection and processing of these data is usually linked to consortial systems where ethnicity is uh, legally relevant for enjoying in some rights, for, for quota systems, for affirmative measure systems, uh, where, where actually uh, people express their ethnicity in order to, to gain uh, some rights or, or to, to, to be part of this, uh, let's say, uh, consortial uh, mechanism. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this diversification of data is important because different uh, legal regimes may apply to different types of uh, data, which I will show later. Uh, so now to the protection of data, uh, first, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, usual justification not to collect ethnic data is that it is uh, prohibited with personal data regulations. So uh, many countries just don't collect data claiming that is, it would be against the, uh, the protection, uh, data protection rules. Uh, but as I will show later, it is not always the, the case. It is just how states excuse themselves of collecting and processing uh, this data. So that brings me to the, the question of context and why ethnic data is still sensitive. Um, there we have a social context and examples of severe misuse of ethnic data in the past. Uh, always typical example is of Nazi Germany and persecution of Jews and of Jews in, because of the, the existence of such data or experience in colonialism times where uh, colonized population has been classified. So uh, this historical context makes a really in, in, in some countries make uh, uh, or supports the, the reluctance to collect collection and processing of, of ethnic data. But there are also contemporary risks of misuse of data for discriminatory treatment of individual persons. Uh, or of perpetuation of stereotypes and stigmatizations of groups and persons belonging to these groups. For example, uh, uh, criminal uh, statistics, which can uh, be misused or misinterpreted by claiming that Roma are more 
criminal perpetrators, which can be statistically uh, the case, but it's not the, 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 the reason or it's not justified to claim that then Rome are more criminal than they and the other population, because not other uh, uh, elements are are uh, brought when analyzing the data. Then also contemporary risk of data mining and ethnic uh, profiling, which we we heard today also a little bit of this. Uh, and ethnic profiling really is uh, one of the severe risk and, and practice uh, also now in this Black Lives Matter uh, 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 movement. We we see that. Uh, actually police is severely profiling people who have physical appearances which is not let's say uh, majority but my, with minority background so what is the, the 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 main question is the question of purpose of processing and using of ethnic data so it's like a, it's a, like a drug which can be used as a medicine or as a poison so it then oh, uh, the the approach cannot be that it's a sensitive issue and that data cannot be collected but then the real approach is actually to minimize the, the the risks and to minimize the or to change the context in which uh ethnic ethnicity as such and also ethnic data becomes normalized and it's not so sensitive so uh, authorities uh, instead of claiming that it's sensitive and uh, illegal, should also um, put more effort in making ethnicity and ethnic data less sensitive, to make less normalized, and to make a context in which this uh, misuse the, of data is uh, minimized. So, um, uh, several notes on the legal framework. Uh, which shows us that actually uh, protection, uh, that the processing of ethnic data is not absolutely prohibited as, as some opponents claim. So uh, I, I picked up two, let's say, uh, core uh, uh, legal uh, acts. One is in, in scope of the, of the Council of Europe, the other in the scope of uh, uh, European Union. And for the Council of Europe framework, it is uh, pertinent this Convention 108, uh, according to which uh, Article 6 say that these data may not be processed automatically unless domestic, domestic law provides appropriate safeguards. You know that there is this uh, modernized, modernized uh, uh, version, but not yet in force. Also claims that processing of these data uh, shall only be allowed where appropriate safeguards are enshrined in law. Uh, and here we have uh, also paragraph two, which exactly uh, points out to minimizing the risks of uh, processing of such data, that uh, safeguards are explicitly uh, uh, targeting risks of uh, uh, discrimination as the major major risk of uh, potential misuse of uh, um, uh, processing of or in using or misinterpreting uh, ethnic uh, data when it comes to uh, gdpr gdpr uses uh, a, a, a a little bit different wording because gdpr explicitly says that processing of personal data revealing the racial or ethnic origin is or shall be prohibited so general prohibition but uh, 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 the story doesn't end here because uh, paragraph two of article nine lists um, several uh, uh, exceptions which are relevant also to uh, processing of uh, ethnic data and uh, I have listed here uh, four of exceptions which are commonly uh, uh, s s quoted when it comes to processing of uh, ethnic data first it's uh, um, when the data subject has given expedited consent when the processing is necessary for uh, legal claims before courts, which is very important when it comes to support using data when supporting uh, discriminatory claims before the courts. So equality statistics to uh, show that uh, persons belonging to some group are uh, 
uh, more affected with some apparently neutral measure. Uh, then uh, processing uh, for the reason substantial public interest. This uh, is uh, pointed out as the, the, main, the, the core let's say, uh, exception relevant for processing of ethnic data that um, uh, guaranteeing and uh, equality and integration of all uh, segments of society is uh, substantial or creates substantial public interest. And this can be used as, as, a, as a good uh, exception or ground for uh, processing ethnic data. And uh, finally, something what is for uh, researchers, but also for uh, pol policy developers, very interesting. This is uh, this non-personal uh, uh, use of or processing of ethnic data for historical research or statistical uh, purposes and scientific of course uh, research. So uh, although the general um, uh, rule is that processing of these data is uh, prohibited, nevertheless Article 9 paragraph 2 uh, uh, opens uh, several channels or grounds under which uh, processing of ethnic data is uh, is lawful and is uh, uh, can be uh, uh, is allowed. So uh, one interesting point, which is uh, uh, often uh, ignored by by opponents to processing of ethnic data, is the scope of application, uh, because uh, GDPR and other data protection regulations. Um, cover protection of personal data. So this is any information relating to an identify or identify a natural person. Uh, whereas if from the moment when the data is not any more personal data, then this legal uh, regime uh, doesn't apply uh, anymore. Um, this doesn't mean that data which is not personal uh, doesn't undergo any uh, scrutiny and uh, and uh, is not obliged to to uh, to follow uh, some minimal standards of protection but nevertheless uh, it's important that uh, statistical data or ethnic data which is not anymore where it's not anymore uh, possible to identify or it, uh, uh, nature or nature data subject uh, is not protected as uh, personal data which is of uh, great importance for uh, statistical uh, processing of data uh, necessary for combating discrimination or promoting uh, integration uh, and the uh, second point, which is also very uh, interesting, uh, especially for us dealing uh, with uh, minor, with these legal aspects and data protection aspects, is the question of data revealing racial, racial or ethnic origin. So the, the formulation is really broad because it's not data on racial or ethnic origin origin but data revealing racial or ethnic origin and then the the question arises where is what is the scope of this uh, interpretation what data actually reveal yeah what data actually reveal racial or ethnic origin is it wider interpretation that also proxies are then um, used as uh, or are under protection as ethnic data or just uh, data uh, directly uh, indicating racial or ethnic origin. I will come back to this question in, in my final slide because it's, it's interesting. So uh, what is the, the key uh, then uh, uh, aspect is that if, uh, if uh, the pr processing of data is permissible and lawful, then of course what is important even more for sensitive data is uh, legal and technical are legal and technical safeguards uh, and these when it comes to legal uh, safeguards it comes to these uh, principles of or milestones of uh, legal protection whereas uh, for ethnic data lawfulness and transparency are very important of course purpose limitation and and uh, 
clarifying what purpose is, of, uh, is for the processing of ethnic data. Uh, data minimization also, the important question is whether data is really necessary and not to extend the, the scope of collecting and processing of data. And of course, uh, 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 security of data and access to data. So then this, this brings me to another uh, point here uh, to technical and organizational measures to in, uh, ensure data security. So access to data uh, and uh, and uh, and security of data in, in general, uh, whereas it's uh, mostly it's commonly stated that uh, pseudonymization and anonymization are crucial uh, elements uh, or, or techniques for protecting ethnic data and making this uh, uh, link between data and per individual personal. Um, uh, to break the link between these two, uh, whereas it's important to state that pseudonymization, uh, pseudon uh, these pseudonymized data remain uh, personal data and remain under the the uh, data protection uh, uh, regulations, whereas where when data are anonymized, they stop to be uh, personal data. And finally. I hope in five minutes I'll, yeah. Uh, finally, my final slide is uh, comes back to this uh, question of which data are actually ethnic data and which data uh, um, get under this uh, 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 provision data revealing uh, racial and ethnic origin. There are some principles uh, and the basic principles is free and voluntary self-identification. Whereas, uh, uh, so person is has to be always free uh, to ex to express own uh, identity, but also not to express and cannot be pushed or or um, uh, uh, to to express own identity. And on the other hand, uh, it's very important that. Uh, it's not possible to, to, to use proxies and it shouldn't be uh, possible to use proxies, uh, for example, language or skin color or birth of, of parents or similar proxies, which countries usually do to, uh, uh, to actually identify persons, but that self-identification should, uh, should be the main, the main uh, uh, principle uh, under which uh, uh, ethnicity is uh, uh, is measured, or uh, it, which brings us to this uh, question that if taken like this, then only data directly linked to ethnicity and race should be considered data revealing uh, race or ethnicity. Um, I will skip this uh, categorization of ethnicities. This is another question how we put open type or preset uh, preset categories. It's a, it's a different uh, and difficult um, uh, story. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the the question uh, arises about the the practical utility of data because in some countries who, uh, which collect data, there is a, a, a regrettably and they are underused, so they are not used used for their purpose, but they are just uh, collected and not further processed. So it's also the question of import, the question of how these data are further used and for the, the better cause of this uh, the, uh, uh, prohibition of discrimination and uh, integration. And finally, my final comment is that uh, the need uh, to collect and further process data uh, doesn't mean uh, full quantification of uh, discrimination, anti-discrimination and integration policies, because we shouldn't go into another extreme, uh, collecting too much data uh, and uh, just uh, uh, rest all policies on, on quantitative uh, parameters, but uh, there, there is a need to, to have a balance between quantitative and qualitative uh, parameters and methods. And data is just a tool, but we cannot use data actually to, uh, to, to substitute the, the policies and anti-discrimination and integration policies, but just to support them to be more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lubika. I, I think it's uh, 
a very relevant topic. I have personally written on some of these issues as far as uh, discrimination in the field of uh, uh, religious freedom is concerned, not on European law, but on American law, because uh, New York Police Department and several other institutions were doing uh, ethnic and racial profiling on Muslims. So this is a, a kind of discussion which has a global scope. Also, if you look at what is happening, for instance, in China against the Muslim minorities and so on, and of course there is a debate also within the European Union. There have been several reports published, both by the DG Justice, for instance, and also by organizations like uh, State Watch. So I want to open the floor from uh, some question which might have arise, and then, of course, give the floor back to the organizers. We have a few minutes for Q&A if there is somebody who wants to intervene. And of course, you can also use the chat if you want. Mr. President, just a question for Ljubica Georgievich, if I may. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I was particularly struck when you were discussing, uh, you know, the, the, the grounds allowed in the GDPR to restrict uh, the prohibition of processing of ethnic data. No? You, you mentioned this Article 9, you, you recalled all the grounds provided for in Article 9. And the ground that struck me most was that of the substantial public interest, because it's not defined at all. And uh, so I wonder, you know, my question here is, is simply, even in this sensitive area, you know, the, the profiling of races and the protection of minority, you have such a broad ground for restricting that uh, apparent uh, uh, prohibition. So I know that that is, of course, a subject to control and review by the Court of Justice of the European Union. But isn't it, isn't it, uh, isn't it this uh, another evidence that uh, in the area of personal data, member states retain a lot of freedom, uh, a lot of leeway? Rubika? Well, yes, generally public interest can be this, let me see. Uh, yeah, public interest can be interpreted in, um, yeah. So the substantial public interest can be really interpreted widely, but it's uh, for us who are promoting uh, uh, processing of ethnic data, it's usually uh, the, the, uh, the ground which is referenced as the, the possible gate opener for processing of, uh, of uh, ethnic data, uh, whereas it's claimed that, uh, uh, that uh, fighting discrimination uh, and, uh, find, uh, and promoting uh, uh, integration is, is a pub, is, uh, is, uh, is a, in public interest. Uh, and the other, let's say, safeguard uh, is that uh, persons cannot be forced to uh, to reveal their ethnic origin. So uh, this is like, uh, like the, uh, you can ask a person to, to declare uh, own uh, identity, but persons should in no way be forced to declare their identity. So there always need to be the, the box not declared or, or undeclared or so, where, where through this like second safeguard people get in, so data are formally collected, but people get the, the, the let's say, the, the uh, backup solution uh, or, or to just not to, to declare our own identity. So yes, we can say that yeah, public interest is there, and uh, and uh, anti-discrimination and integration are public interest. But even if there, this is in, in place, then persons cannot be forced to declare own identity. So thank you, Rubika. Do we have uh, other questions also for the other speakers of the last session, in case? I would have a question if nobody wants to kick in. Yes. Uh, and my question would be for uh, uh, Maria Casoria. I really uh, appreciated 
her intervention, and I was uh, particularly interested in the theory which incorporates the notion of privacy into the product characteristics that define the quality, and therefore uh, kind of uh, sketch out a theory of harm based on restriction on quality and innovation as opposed to price restriction of price uh, uh, harm, uh, harms on the basis of uh, price effects. Uh, however, let's be it. We have an elephant, an, an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room it is the market definition, meaning how to establish dominance. And uh, we, uh, if one can actually evoke uh, uh, theory, which has been implemented you know, quite widely, like uh, the essential, faci essential facility doctrine. So data considered as essential facility. Uh, if you make the uh, parallelism with the uh, technology markets, you have the essential patents example. But again, if you look at the effect on downstream markets uh, and services and uh, products where the market remain contestable in the uh, markets in which the technology is applied. And he here I have my question, I mean, and I want to play the table advocate because this is going to be a very uh, hot debate in the next month. Uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the market definition, not from a static, from, but from a dynamic perspective, then you can see that uh, this, some of these giants uh, are giants with a foot of clay. Uh, meaning that, take the example of uh, MySpace. MySpace uh, had the dominant position so forth, in, uh, for uh, three, four, five years and then disappeared completely. Uh, if you look at Facebook today, uh, it is very strong in certain demographics, but uh, younger generations switch to Snapchat uh, and increasingly to TikTok. So it indicates that the markets remain contestable and perhaps the, um, the uh, Entry barriers are not unsurmountable to a certain uh, extent. So what's your take in terms of the first step of the analysis of 102 or dominance, it is to establish dominance, in which market you would establish? Yeah, as I agree that it's not easy to define the market that is the prerequisite for the dominance. However, and that's what in Germany has been done, I think that the first step would be looking at the services offered. So if we look at the social media networks, then we should understand if in that specific market there are alternatives. And we know that as of today, apart from Facebook that has incorporated most of the other services, there is no alternative. So. Obviously, we cannot, I mean, internet per se is a huge market. So we cannot really say that because the data have the potential to circulate everywhere through internet, this is our market. So in my opinion, the first step would be, let us look at the service that the operators are offering and then we start categorizing the market. Because an alternative that we have is to look at the market as two-sided market, right? That is the other approach that has been taken by the antitrust enforcement. And so these particular online platforms have been understood as market that on one side collect for free data and on the other side sell this data to the advertisers. But in my opinion, the first approach would be to look at the service offered and try to understand as the market evolves and eventually competitors <laughs> come up into the market how the definition can be tailored. But this will be my best approach for now, since things are evolving. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, I have to stop here, otherwise we will run too much late, because I, I need to give the floor back to the organizer, which I thank for having me here moderating this uh, morning session. So we, uh, we finished on time. I hope you enjoyed the conversation exchanges this morning. Thank you very much to all the presenters.
and uh, I'm happy to give the floor back to uh, Professor Palmieri and Professor Pavoni. Thank you. Hello. So I think Alessandro, I'm going first. Do you agree? Ricardo, you go. You go. You start. You start. Uh, yeah. I start. Yes, okay. Sir. Just just a few just a few minutes actually because you, we are really late as uh, as our chairman has just said. So I don't want to steal uh, more of your Saturday time. Um, this is just first of all to thank everybody actually because I think we had very three very very productive uh, days. We actually discussed many areas uh, of the law and policy of the European Union relating to security and we I personally learned a lot from the very varied and different contributions that we uh, that we were uh, privileged to listen to the many speakers we listened to so just to uh, say to wrap up our discussions uh, by way of conclusions uh, and uh, in, in a very uh, say concise way i think that um, you know the first uh, value added uh, coming up coming coming from uh, emerging from, uh, from from this research endeavor is that uh, we actually uh, uh, opened up many many more research questions actually we we really realized that the area of security both as uh, as far as the law is concerned and policy are concerned is really a very fertile ground for uh, undertaking research so this is just also an occasion to uh, thank uh, uh, professor mario perini who is not here today but as, as the others uh, the other colleagues from siena may, may witness is also a legal mind behind our project because the original idea was actually professor perini's idea to focus on security so let's say just to collect some uh, let's say general ideas or common things which have emerged from uh, this different uh, and uh, very very uh, um, stimulating uh, discussions and uh, speeches that we uh, uh, enjoyed during these three days uh, i think that first of all i think what is clear to me uh, when discussing uh, the topic of security uh, uh, from from any uh, angle, both in the area of data, migrants, uh, or financial flows, that actually there is a, a widespread uh, 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 perception or conviction that uh, that we need more Europe. Actually, we need more uh, uh, more action by the European Union. Uh, there is a, a widespread conviction that member states alone. Uh, 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 cannot do much in these areas, so uh, I think this is a, a positive message that we are that we are launching at the end of this project. Uh, this is not the time when uh, where we should uh, uh, pursue uh, uh, an agenda of a reduced action by the European Union. I think that in, in the areas that we covered, there is we really need more more intervention, more coordination more harmonization and more uh, uniform policies and uh, legal actions undertaken by the member states under the guidance of the European Union and its institutions. I think this is very much clear to me. Uh, we started with Professor Wouters uh, uh, last Thursday afternoon, uh, who is just uh, advocating uh, uh, a more robust action by the European Union in the area of foreign affairs, uh, in the area of the common foreign and security policy. He actually ended his uh, presentation by saying that uh, he thinks that uh, it's really unbelievable that the European Commission uh, doesn't have a very, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, competencies in the area of uh, foreign affairs and security policy. Uh, and then uh, the same emerges very clearly in the area of, uh, uh, of the uh, common asylum policy, uh, migratory policy, where actually uh, it's really inconceivable that uh, member states can uh, uh, undertake, uh, um, can, can go, go ahead without, uh, without a clear guidance and a clear policy and legal guidance 
by the European Union. Uh, in the area of uh, um, uh, the same goes for financial flows, uh, cross-border financial threats, uh, the area of money laundering, it's inconceivable that we uh, that member states, uh, um, uh, let's say, step back and uh, uh, reclaim uh, uh, competences in this area at, uh, at, uh, at the expenses of, of the common European agenda. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to especially more specifically to uh, the area of uh, the migrants fundamental rights and issues of security related to migratory flows um, actually i mean i think that every almost every speaker made it clear that uh, uh, the key word here should be more solidarity among member states more mutual trust and more respect for fundamental rights. Uh, so I think this is very clear to me that uh, if we want to go uh, ahead in a, in, a, in a sensible way in this area, uh, that there is more need for solidarity and to focus on the protection of fundamental rights of migrants. Uh, I think that uh, all the interventions went in this direction, especially Professor Lenzerini, the very first days, made very clear and insightful remarks on this uh, uh, enhanced need for solidarity in this area and a mutual trust among member states uh, along the coordinate uh, with a, a fundamental uh, coordination role by the European Union institutions. Um, the same goes for, for example, uh, uh, the, the, the speech by Katerina Kazalova uh, yesterday morning, uh, she discussed uh, the detention practices uh, of European Union member states uh, in the uh, uh, vis a vis uh, uh, minor migrants, so the children, the protection of children in the context of migratory flows. She underlined this uh, disparity and diversity of practices in the European Union member states when the final message was that. Uh, this is inconceivable in a European Union uh, that, for example, Ireland should have uh, a total prohibition of detention of children, whereas in other in other member states uh, things uh, are very uh, are very different. So there is even here a need for a more robust harmonization of policies in this key area and more uh, collaboration between the European Union institutions and member states. Um, the other, the other, the other, from my perspective, which is more a public law perspective, then Professor Palmieri will discuss more about the private law perspective. From public law perspective, the, the, the most intriguing issue in this area, uh, which emerges very clearly from uh, these the discussions uh, uh, during these three days, uh, is how to frame security in terms of rights. Because, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, what emerges once again, I knew already this, but uh, now I'm even more convinced about this. Uh, the security is a, uh, is a policy semantic concept in law and policy. Uh, security is a right of states, for sure, national security, public order, etc. But it's also a matter of fundamental human rights of individuals. So there is this, you know, different meanings. Uh, uh, which are very much made clear in the uh, this, in the second uh, in the second conception as a matter of uh, uh, individual human rights. Uh, we just need to have a look at the, uh, at the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, where Article Six, which opens uh, the title on freedoms, uh, is devoted to the right to human security, the right of security of persons. And the intriguing question is when, you know, these uh, two different conceptions uh, may come into conflict one with another. And we, of course, we, during these days, we uh, listen to many examples or uh, areas or cases where this may actually happen. So uh, think, of course, uh, all the interferences by states uh, in the right to data security which may be pursued uh, uh, in the name of the fight against organized crime. For example, um, think about, uh, uh, again, uh, the right, to, uh, the right to, uh, 
to freedom of expression. You know, uh, Paolo Cesarini uh, today was uh, trying to reframe Article 11 or re uh, rewrite Article 11 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights by saying that, okay, there is a, the right to impart uh, information should be read like the right to impart reliable information because there is this uh, uh, increasing problem and challenge uh, uh, arising in the area of disinformation and, and, and fake news. And the examples uh, may multiply here. Uh, so the, the basic rights that we analyzed during these days, and especially this is true for the uh, right of privacy and the right to data security, are rights which are very much in flux. Uh, we, we need to we need to study more in this area. We need to examine very closely the emerging practice here. Uh, for example, you know, uh, I, I don't see Professor Pardolesi right now, but he was with us before. Uh, uh, he made, made a keynote address in the first way, which to me was very much illuminating in this area. He described the trajectory of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union with respect to the right to be forgotten. And he concluded his uh, keynote speech by saying that privacy is not absolute at all, uh, that the right to be forgotten has been diluted to a great extent in the recent jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So I think that here there is an increasing need to, uh, uh, to test our assumptions in this area in the light, uh, of course, uh, of uh, technological challenges and technological progress. Uh, uh, I, I would like to stop here, not to take uh, more time, and I, uh, uh, the floor is Alessandro's. Alessandro, you still there? Probably has a problem with the connection. Oh, I'm sorry about this. There must be a technical problem with uh, Professor Palmieri's connection. Marco, you, you want to say something while we're waiting for Alessandro? I, I, I was just ready with my final words, but uh, my short uh, final statement, uh, but I'll still uh, give Alessandro a chance to come back. I, I, see, I see you're moving again, Ale Alessandro, so you might be able to... Uh, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Good. I'm back. I'm back. Yes. The technical yes. problem. So uh, here, here's my part of the second part of the conclusions. Uh, uh, now we are really approaching to the end of this final conference of the of the BSEC project, uh, and we had uh, three days of uh, intense and uh, fruitful discussion. Of course, finishing the conference does not amount to the end of the project. Uh, indeed, as you know, we are working to publish uh, the, the book, a book uh, uh, that aims at summing up uh, the current state of knowledge on the security issues and uh, at establishing uh, a channel of communication uh, between uh, the academic community and the policy makers. Uh, my conclusions that I, I promise will be brief are going to focus on two of the areas covered by the project and of course uh, uh, areas that were included in the program of this final conference, namely financial flows and, and data flows. But let me first of all uh, even on my side, thank all the person who actively contributed to the success. I think it was a successful project, the success of the initiative, and especially to the friends and colleagues who ac accepted our invitation to take part in this final conference uh, in these troubling times. And uh, every several uh, people have, have been thanked so far, but my special thanks on behalf uh, of uh, all the members of the group goes to my friend and the team colleague, Professor Marco Ventura, for his brilliant way of supervising all the activities carried out uh, in the framework of the project, and for having given the key staff members the opportunity to develop their 
specific uh, inter initiative and trajectories. So due to the time constraints, uh, uh, it's not possible for me to recall all the details, all the interesting details that have emerged uh, in uh, all the intervention of yesterday and afternoon and this morning. Let me say that all the participants in the relevant sessions have offered uh, some really interesting and insightful observation showing a very good understanding of the different topics dealt with. So, some words uh, about uh, the, the papers presented in the first session the, uh, yesterday in, in, during the afternoon. Personally, uh, I learned a lot of things uh, about, uh, for instance, regulatory sandboxes. It was the, the topic of uh, uh, Professor Adoracion Perez's presentation. Digital currencies uh, that uh, Marta Bojina dealt with. Open banking. We, we have heard about the different aspects of this, uh, of, of this uh, new, really new and uh, important uh, movement uh, uh, from uh, uh, Professor Ribas and from uh, Cecilia Calderelli. Uh, all of these topics, uh, as uh, in my opinion, but as it, as it has emerged from the discussions, are crucial for ensuring security in two dimensions, not, not only in respect of individual interests, uh, private interests, interests of individual as consumers, as payers, but also interests of firms, banks, uh, uh, service providers, uh, and, and so and so, uh, but also in respect of the society, the security of the society as a whole. And so, uh, as uh, Ricardo said before, of course, uh, coordination at, at the European level is needed in this field uh, to avoid uh, uh, risks, uh, not only uh, for uh, uh, as I said, not only my consumers' interest, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, defense against criminal organizations and uh, uh, also terrorist uh, organizations that uh, uh, leverage on uh, on financial flows. Uh, but um, I think that, and uh, all the speakers uh, agreed on this, that there is a need uh, of more research to investigate this uh, phenomena further and in order to offer feasible solutions uh, to decision makers at, at the national level as well as the European level. And uh, in this respect, let me say that uh, a research unit based in, uh, in the University of Siena in cooperation with the University of Alcala and uh, uh, a Polish university and also the legal service directorate of the Bank of Italy is uh, planning to launch uh, a project uh, specifically on the open banking movement. Uh, let's let's uh, uh, let's go to the other to the other side uh, to the data flows and uh, in, in data protection. Generally speaking, an an analogous considerations can be made uh, on the theme uh, of data flows. Uh, so in the keynote sessions, as Ricardo remember, we have heard a brilliant speech from Roberto Pardoletti, forgive me my conflict of interest because we are co-authors of several publications. And today, I think, I think all the five presenters have enlightened us on different, several aspects related not only to We lost you again, Alessandro. That's a real pity because we were speaking now about the speakers of today.
Alessandro, you, you can maybe uh, switch off your your camera to facilitate your connection. Marco, why don't you step in? Eh? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, okay. uh, I, uh, I take this, uh, this opportunity to express my warmest thanks to Isabella Mazze for her assistance. She's been uh, great in the uh, preparation uh, or, and the uh, handling of this meeting and as she's been in the past for um, other events uh, uh, of the project including uh, the workshop we had on cybersecurity in Trento at FBK. Um, thanks to um, Gian Maria Milani, I said yesterday already how important uh, his uh, constant care for the project was um, thanks to um, uh, Ricardo and Alessandro uh, for the again constant uh, presence and, and, and inspiration and Mario Perini as Ricardo mentioned for his uh, vision which made this project possible and his uh, contribution including in the idea of having Terra project uh, contributing this uh, beautiful virtual um, uh, exhibition. Alessandro is back. I give you the floor. Sorry, I apologize. All the morning, the connection was perfect, and, and then in the end, I had problems. So my, now I'm speaking with my smartphone, and, I, and it's okay that I was concluding my conclusions. <laughs> And I was saying that, uh, summarizing uh, uh, with respect of the data flows and, and, uh, and uh, related aspects, uh, uh, I think we, we can be proud as European, uh, we can be proud of what Europe uh, has done so far. Europe has, has taken the lead in this field uh, with GDPR, uh, with the other initiatives and documents that were mentioned by uh, Paolo Cesarini and also by, by Luz Martinez. Uh, uh, but, of course, there is uh, still a long road to do. And just think about the fact that, uh, on the one hand, uh, some remedies are not so strong as they should be, are not so protective. And on the other hand, uh, an excess of data protection may cause unintended consequences, even at the expense of fundamental interests. Uh, probably, as it was, it is, as the, as, at the, uh, <coughs> sorry, as it has been pointed out by Professor Pardolesi, with respect, uh, with specific respect to the right of to be forgotten, but this the same pattern can be applied uh, uh, to other uh, aspects of uh, data protection. Flexibility of remedies uh, may be the key, may be the key to ensure uh, a proper balancing of interests. Uh, so, finally, uh, in both fields, uh, in both areas of uh, movement of capitals and of uh, data flows, uh, uh, some targets have been achieved so far, but uh, uh, we need, Europe needs, uh, let me say Europe needs, to pursue more ambitious goals. And uh, to conclude, we hope uh, that uh, we, with this project, with this conference and with the forthcoming book, uh, we hope to help uh, institutions to perform this uh, these difficult tasks, 
and maybe we will become a part, an important part of that multidisciplinary community of fact searchers, data specialists and researchers to which Paolo Cesarini referred in his speech this morning and so to give our contribution to the improvement of regulation in this very, very important area that uh, reflect to the security for Europe uh, as, a, as, a, as a continent, the European Union, and for all of us as citizens. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry for, for the technical problems. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. So I, I reiterate my thanks to Ricardo and Alessandro, adding my gratitude for your concluding remarks. Looking forward to reading you and the others uh, in the forthcoming book need to mention that two books have already been published as a result of uh, this uh, a series of, of events in this project, one uh, uh, about the uh, meeting which took place in Banska Bistrica, and I'm very grateful for the partners, Lovak partners, for this as well. And the other one <clears throat> is a monograph uh, from Daniele Ferrari on uh, uh, minority uh, rights of religion or belief communities in the international sphere. Uh, many thanks to Pasquale Anichino for his brilliant chair this morning. Uh, thank you so much for the presenters and the speakers uh, who, who, who were really, really amazing this morning and the previous days for in particular those of uh, uh, them who are still with us at this late uh, stage of our conference. Um, my thanks to uh, the, the, all the partners, University of Siena, FBK, Flensburg as, as well. It was good to have Lubica with us uh, today. And uh, finally, um, many, many thanks to participants and, and people in the attendance. I need to mention that some of them were not lawyers, were not engineers, they were philosophers or sociologists. It was probably difficult for them to... Uh, to follow all the um, all the presentations, but I, I'm, I'm very very grateful to all uh, uh, to everybody in the attendance. I shared with you um, a uh, our forthcoming webinar series on AI and religion at FBK. We will share future initiatives from the law department of the University of Siena, other um, other units from University of Siena and and, and FBK. And again, uh, thank you so much and enjoy the, the rest of the, of the weekend and uh, hopefully let's be in, in touch for, for the future.